Hey, what's going on guys? It's Mike from Fieldcraft Survival. If I'm looking at you all funny, it's because the camera is on one side and I'm trying to look at myself because it doesn't look so odd. But if you see my eyes drifting, I promise I'm not cross-eyed. No offense to cross-eyed people. Um, you guys have been asking me, hey, basic gun handling. We've done this before. I've done it many times on lives, teaching people on Instagram. But I want to ensure that I give you a recorded version of this so you guys can go back and forth and, and focus on the things that you're weak at. Um, a lot of people via COVID-19 are settled in place. You might be watching this because you're self-quarantining. You're not allowed to leave your home. The governor of Arizona uh, tonight issued uh, all, everybody will stay home and shelter in place starting tomorrow, Tuesday at 5 p.m. So things are changing rapidly in our society and we just have to adapt and overcome. Part, part of this adaptation is you guys tuning into content and might be your first time learning from me or Philcraft Survival via this technique or tactic, but that's okay. We'll, we'll do the best that we can. Uh, you know, a little bit of background about me. I'm a special operations guy. I spent most of my life in the infantry and special operations, as well as a US government contractor for the CIA. I've done a whole bunch of stuff, been overseas, um, more importantly, in the context to this, uh, I've trained people to shoot guns my entire life. Uh, indigenous forces in Afghanistan, Yemen, Iraq, the list goes on, but also training law enforcement and civilians really for the last decade. Um, I like to break things down in layman's terms. I do not like to speak like I'm an academic on top, uh, speaking down, dictating uh, I like to speak common level at the tactical level, we call it, so you can better understand what's going on. I am a federal firearms instructor. I'm a FLETC qualified federal firearms instructor. Um, I have a degree in Homeland Security and crisis management. Um, but the, yeah, that's enough about me. Let's, let's talk about guns. Uh, look, there's a different kinds of guns. There's, there's guns that are based or named or... Um, utilize in different forms and functions depending on how they cycle in their operation. So there's characteristics that are important to talk about in self-defense that you should understand before you make a decision to get a gun, but also relates to the conversation of how we're going to operate this gun. The first thing I'll talk about is a double action pistol. This is not a double action pistol. This is a SIG 320X carry, but the SIG P320 or the SIG uh, 226 is a double action gun. Double action denotes the cycle of operation um, and, and really the number of actions it has while doing its cycle of operation or shooting. Uh, real, realistically, it's just shooting. So a double action gun, what would happen is I would pull this trigger. And when I pull this trigger, this gun would have a hammer and the hammer would rotate to the rear. And when I fully depress that trigger, it will slam forward. That's two actions. That's me pulling the trigger, and that's the hammer moving back and forth. Some people think it's the back action and the forward action. We'll just go with the, with the, uh, uh, the trigger as the single action because single action will make more sense to you then. So in this case, I have a Tri-11 by Triarch Systems. It's a great company that makes a great pistol. This is one of my favorite pistols. This pistol is super accurate, um, super efficient, and super reliable. When I pull the trigger on this, what would happen is if this was a double action, I would pull the trigger, the hammer would rotate to the rear and then slam forward, hitting the firing pin, and just like I described in the bullet, hitting the back of the primer and starting combustion. So a, a single action gun, you only have one motion where you pull the trigger, the hammer goes forward in that same, mo in that same motion of you pulling the trigger and it goes boom. Single action only pistols like this or Glock or similar center fire pistols do the same exact same thing, or center striker pistols, excuse me, do the same exact thing, where I just simply pull the trigger and it goes boom. Now, the mechanism that you would uh, think is the hammer is internal, um, so there's no external factor for the hammer slamming forward to be able to strike the firing pin to strike the primer. Uh, in a nutshell, what I, what I want you to think about is the fact that there's a, a lot of excessive things happening, and I, I, I use excessive loosely, but a lot of things taking place outside of single action pistols. That's why I'm a fan of single action pistols. I have this same pistol 
SIG P320 X carry in a 220 configuration, which is 45, which is double action and single action. It has both, uh, meaning you pull the trigger, the hammer goes back, it slams forward. After the first time it cycles, the hammer is now back. And now you pull the trigger and it just goes forward. That's one action. So I like a pistol for self-defense that I could pull out, go to work by just pulling the trigger and not having to overthink anything. The reason I like that is because under stress, you are going to want the pistol that is reliable, repeatable under stress. You don't want to think about chambering around. You don't want to think about dropping a safety. You don't want to think about gripping a safety. You just want to think about going to work um, and saving your life. I want to mention that up, up, up front because I want you to understand how this works. So when we're talking about safety, every single firearm that you come across, if you teach this, which is the best way to learn this, is by teaching what you're learning today. Teach everybody in your family, your friends, your network to always treat a firearm as if it's loaded. So even if this gun is not loaded, and I know, let's say I confirmed it's not loaded, I'm still not going to flag people. I'm not going to point my barrel at those people. A safe direction is up, a safe direction is down, but pointing this gun is unacceptable at a person. The second thing I would do is I would never put my finger on the trigger, even on a gun that I knew was empty, unless I was dry firing by orienting the gun in a safe direction and dry firing the pistol. So I wouldn't just arbitrarily point this at somebody and pull the trigger. Never do that, right? And I always want to consider the fact that if I put the pistol down and I walk away, that maybe when I come back and I pick this gun up, somebody might have messed with it. Somebody might have accidentally just messing with it, loaded around. Um, they might have uh, taken the gun and, and put it in a different configuration than I left it with. So it's easy to assume that every gun is loaded or, or actually um, locked and loaded and a potential danger. So we have to clear the gun first. This is the first lesson that I'm going to teach you guys today. So when I pick up a gun, the first thing I'm going to do is lock this slide to the rear. Again, you have a slide catch on this end. I'm going to grab the rear of the gun or the front of the gun. I have strong hands, so I can take my fingers and push it, pull it back. Or you could take the back of the gun and pull it back. For practice, just grab it with one hand. You don't have to worry about the slide catch. And just do this a couple of times. Get used to the feeling of pulling back and pushing forward to get the slide to open up. Right? So does that, does that. So if I want to lock this to the rear, I have to put slight upwards pressure on the slide catch. It doesn't take a lot of pressure. It's very minute. So you don't have to jam and push. You simply have to raise the slide catch while you're pulling it to the rear and it will lock the slide, leaving you with an open chamber. So an open chamber allows you to clear this gun properly. The three significant checks for checking if this gun is loaded uh, or unloaded is one, inside the barrel. If there was a round sitting inside the barrel, you would see the shiny back end of the primer that would look like that. That's a bullet. No bullet, that's what it would look like, right? You see the barrel, the inside of the barrel. The next thing you would wanna check is the seated magazine. So this magazine was seated, you would see the top of a round. But remember, if you're checking this at weird angles like this, this is why I like this workspace box that I always talk about. This is my workspace. I don't like clearing guns feet away from my eyes. I want to keep my eyes close to the gun. That's not unsafe. That's actually really safe because now I can see what I'm working with. As opposed, especially in low light situations where the gun is away from my face. So a big mistake make, made is they look inside the barrel to do their check but they ignore or they skip over the fact that they have a magazine in it because they haven't dropped the source of feed. And so they go, oh, it's clear. Hey, it's clear. And then they shoot themselves in the foot. Let's not do that. So dropping the source of feed is the primary uh, and first thing that we do if a gun has a magazine in it. Just remember that. This one didn't have one, I picked it up. But if it did, that's the first thing I would wanna do. So if I wanna make sure this is clear, I see space. If it's limited uh, light visibility, I'm gonna stick my finger in it. 
That's what he said. Or I'm going to put my finger down into it. I'm not going to check the block with this check. A three-point inspection on this gun to ensure it's safe is imperative to gun safety. The next thing I'm going to do is check the bolt face. The bolt face is right here. If there's a bullet sitting on the bolt face, you would see the bullet sitting in the chamber. Not in the actual barrel, but in the chamber well. Well, there's nothing there, so it's obviously not there. But the reason you don't check the block on that check, per se, is because if you just check the block, there's some bolts that have receded bolts that are back in the slide. Don't ignore that fact. Pay attention to that. So look into it. One, two, three. And I do all these checks just like this. Just like that. So what if this had a magazine in it? I'm going to show you how to clear a loaded gun. So this gun's loaded. I pick it up, treating it as if it's loaded, because it is. I'm going to drop the source of feed. I'm indexing. Notice I'm indexing my finger on the side of this uh, frame. That's super important because I don't want to have my finger hovering here because a flinch response is this, this. And if you're squeezing and you're holding the trigger floating it, then you would smash that trigger and then you would potentially have an accidental discharge. So I have this set up this way. I'm going to drop the source of feed by pushing the mag release on this side. The magazine comes out, I simply set it down. Now, some of you guys are high speed because you, you shoot USPSA and that's fine. You want to catch the rounds. I'm not a fan of catching rounds. I know I can catch the rounds, but I'm not going to. Right? So the, only, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the rear of the gun and then I'm going to extract the round. I want to see that round eject and extract out of my uh, chamber. That means the round is gone. Um, and I'll pick it up later. Then I'm going to lock the slide to the rear and do my three-point check. One, barrel or chamber. Two, magazine. Three, bolt face. It's clear. Then I'm going to let the bolt or the slide go forward by just pulling on the rear and letting it go. You don't have to manually, deliberately, slowly let it go forward. Just pull the rear and let it go. Once it's good, it's good. That is a clear gun. Now I know it's clear. Some of you guys, because of USPSA, you'll just inadvertently drop the trigger because that's part of the check where you do this and then you just drop the hammer. I don't like doing that. I'm not a fan of that. So don't do that. Uh, simply make sure it's clear. You don't have to pull the trigger, put it away. And then if you are handing the gun to somebody and you want to give them a gun that's unloaded, common courtesy is always lock the slide to the rear, three point check it yourself, Hand them the rear of the gun with the barrel facing down. That's how I hand over a gun. So they see it's an empty magwell, and then they get the hand their hand on it, and then they do a three-point check themselves, and it's empty. That's how you safely hand over a gun. So again, it's here. Hey, man, give me your gun. Three-point check. One, two, three. Boom. Here's your gun. See that? That easy. Okay. Hey, guys, this is part one of this video. I got to go home because I got to get home before it gets dark and I'm hungry. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, I love doing this, man. Um, even though we're all getting locked down together, it's good. It feels good to be home with family and friends. It also feels good that you guys are tuned in to more content. Our, our analytics have accelerated because you guys are tuning in more to all this stuff that we've been talking about for years, that I've been talking about for years. Uh, I, I feel really bad about the people who are contracting this infectious disease. The reason I do feel horrible about it is if you didn't know, when you get COVID-19, you have to be quarantined and contained. And that means loved ones can't come and visit you and see you. I heard a podcast today about a 32 year old who was afraid to die without seeing his wife and kid. He was a physician assistant and the first identified COVID-19 patient in the state of New Jersey. And he had 40% after his cat his second CAT scan, he discovered 40% of his lungs uh, were infected with bacterial pneumonia. And luckily, he got the right medications to reverse it and to get his oxygen levels uh, back uh, to healthy norms. But he was scared about not seeing his wife or kissing his wife or kissing his kid goodbye. And today, um, I, I think it's near 100 people have passed away that way, not being able to spend time with loved ones and simply passing away. So don't be a dick. Don't be an asshole. This is affecting a lot of people's lives in a negative way. So does everything else. 
But that doesn't mean we have to take away or detract away from what's happening to real people in real time and real life in our country. I hope you guys stay healthy and happy. Um, I'm going to be doing part two of this video tomorrow. And we're going to talk about loading uh, and unloading procedures as well as how to hold this gun and self-defense considerations. Thanks, guys. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Mike. I want to continue this conversation that we were having about basic gun handling and safety, um, also a little bit about pistol defense, and I want to stay uh, chronological on this. The first video, if you're just tuning into this video, is about 10, 15 minutes, and it's the video before this one. I'm going to do these chronologically and stay consistent with the messaging. We do have other things going on with Phil Crowd Survival, like I'm, I'm loading out right now for a like little bug out content for YouTube. Uh, we want to educate you on bugging out principles that we talked about in the podcast. Also, how you would do it on foot versus how you do it in vehicles. In fact, we posted a, a bug out vehicle course, which we've done before on OverlandTraining.com and PhilCrowdSurvival.com. It's already sold out, but essentially it's a trail run and you learn along the way. We stop at certain areas, talk about survival, talk about med, talk about security, and then we camp overnight, and then you guys are released in the morning. Uh, but it's a great opportunity to consider bugging out from a rural, or in this case, an urban environment into a rural area. Why would you bug out? You know, when we train in special operations for the worst case scenario, bugging out is a part of escape and evasion. But for you, it might just be displacing yourself from an urban, populated, maybe problematic, catastrophic situation, and then moving on foot or moving via your vehicle to somewhere more rural. Uh, and it doesn't have, it could be from San Francisco to, you know, the foothills of the Sierras in Northern California. It doesn't have to be apocalyptic. So when we talk about in the context of bugging out, we are talking about the worst case scenario, but it definitely and 100% will apply to your circumstance if you could plan for that worst case, you understand the processes, the packing list, the considerations, that when you apply it to your circumstance, which probably isn't going to be as bad, it's just going to be better for, better for you in preparation. Again, in talking about the COVID stuff, before I go into our next little block of instruction, look, I want, to, I want people to understand, outside of media hype, that there are good statistics, there are good models, and there are good scientists and doctors who are speaking from experience, especially when it comes to infectious disease. Uh, in this case, the, that infectious disease is a virus known as COVID-19, that there is a definitive difference between the flu and what's going on here. Number one, you should just take it for what it's worth um, outside of the, the properties, the molecular proper, properties of what the actual virus is as compared to the flu. You should understand the ramifications that it's having issued as a pandemic in the world and the economic strife and toll it's taken on us already. So delineating the difference between the two is important in moving forward as individuals, as small tribes and communities and families, but understanding society-wise what we have to do to be better prepared in the future, but also get through this circumstance by ourselves. So what I mean is people who keep perpetuating them the conversation. This is just like the flu. What's the big deal? It's like, just stop, please. For the sake of us moving forward and being better prepared in our circumstances in the future, let's just stop because it's not that. It's it's way beyond what the type A, type B standard seasonal flu is in every shape, form, and fashion. At the molecular level, at the R0 factor, at the infectious rates, at the number of people who are potentially modeled to potentially be uh, casualties of this circumstance. So let's just stop. Let's instead focus on things that we could do moving forward to be better prepared if this situation continues to compound itself economically, uh, individually, in your everyday life. Um, look, we're under shelter in place in Arizona as of 5 o'clock p.m. Two weeks ago, I told my guys more than likely we would not be under a shelter in place because it would not affect us like it would affect the rest of the United States. But I didn't anticipate the governor of our state making that decision uh, and, and so soon. So what does that mean for us? Well, we're, we're an essential business. It really doesn't affect us much, 
but for you, it can mean different things. So let's stay on, stay focused and, and stay on our current azimuth and how we're going to deal with this by coming up with creative means, understanding the science. The FDA just uh, approved a 15 minute test and evaluation and looking at different courses of action to deal with this in real time, as opposed to continuing to be a dead horse. Uh, and I'm sorry for beating that dead horse with you guys. All right, let's get to it, man. Pistols. We were talking about pistol considerations for safety. A lot of you are getting into firearms for the first time. It is the responsibility of mine as a owner of a preparedness company, um, but also I feel even as a background in special forces as an 18 Bravo or special forces weapons sergeant, I should be clearly delineating this. It's weird because I took that re responsibility in the military and took it very seriously and educating my guys on the detachment about firearms and tactics. And I feel that same burn and passion in trying to uh, educate you. Uh, not that kind of burn, the burn of passion. Uh, so the first thing I'm gonna do is talk about this SIG. We hashed last time, how do I clear, um, how do I manipulate and handle a gun for the first time? This is a pistol, it's a semi-automatic pistol, which means when I pull the trigger, it goes boom. All right, guys, so the, where we left off, sorry I had a phone call real quick, but where we left off is, hey, when you pick up a gun, how are you supposed to handle it? The assumption is always that guns are loaded, especially if you walk away from it. So even though this is my gun, it's loaded, I understand the status of it right now. If I step or if I move my eyes away from this gun, I'm going to consider it as a status check and to be sure that this gun is unloaded or um, loaded properly. Um, basically in the same status that I left it. In this case, I'm going to unload it because I want to show and make clear so I can use this for demonstration purposes. But the fact of the matter is it really doesn't change. All procedures remain the same in loading, unloading, and showing and making clear. So here we go. I'm going to pick up the gun, orient it in a safe direction. Remember, we're not going outside of this box. This box is my work zone. Uh, the reason being is I want to be able to see what I'm uh, dealing with. If I'm clearing it low, clearing it high, or something weird, I'm not going to be able to see in this gun. Especially, I mean, this is reasonable light. It's not crazy. But in low light conditions, even this, I can't really see in dark little holes. That's what he said. Okay, so I dropped this magazine, which is releasing the source of feed via the magazine release on the side of the gun. Typically on the support side of the gun. But they can have it on this side as an ambi, where you can push it on this, this side. So get rid of the magazine. I just put it away. Simply put it away. Next, I'm going to keep my finger along the frame of the gun and I'm going to grab the rear of the gun. I personally use the front end of the gun because I like seeing the chamber while I'm looking down into it. But you could use the back, especially if you have little hands or uh, you're potentially a woman with little hands. Not, no offense to woman, women with uh, big hands. So I take this and I pull this back. The round extracts, rejects, and I see that. That's, that's part of the... Uh, reassurance and understanding that the round that was in the chamber is now gone. There's no source of feed, so it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be anything else. It would be the round that's there. But I'm still going to lock the slide to the rear. Remember, this one has an ambidextrous slide catch or slide release on both sides. So I could just do it on either side. I want to do it on the weak side, which is my left side. And I'm going to pull back to the rear. And I'm slight pressure up and then pull it to the rear and it just locks the slide. This is an open breach. I could do the same thing with the front end of the gun, just doing it like this, to each their own. If you have strong hands and you could do it from the front, do it from the front. Just make sure you don't flag your hand by sticking your fingers over the barrel. So now that I have a clear breach, again, three point check, inside the barrel, which is the breach, inside the magwell, which means I have clear view of the outside world, and then the bolt face, which is right here on this portion of it. Breach, magazine, Bolt face, it's clear. Now let's slide go forward and I'm not gonna pull the trigger on this and that's that's good enough. Now we're gonna go over load procedures. So load procedures is essentially doing it backwards. I'm gonna take the slide, pull it to the rear and that's gonna give me an open chamber. I like one to have my, my hand, I'll explain this in grip in the next video, but I love to have my hand properly seated up on the back of this frame and my middle finger properly seated underneath the trigger guard. That's because I have good purchase of this. But I'm also building and instituting the muscle memory required of a slide lock or tactical reload where my hand will be in a similar position. 
So I'm getting used to handling the gun, loading, unloading, showing, making clear in the same way that I would tactically. Because you know what I'm doing right now is I'm loading in an admin position or an admin circumstance where I have time. If it was a slide lock or a tactical reload, which are the two types of reloads, reloads that I'll go over, then the circumstances might vary in speed because I don't have a lot of time because I might be in a really bad circumstance of running out of ammo in the middle of a gunfight. So this is locked open. As I said it uh, before, I want to keep it in this box or fill the view. I'm gonna turn the gun sideways, right? I've already understand that it's clear because I've done my three point check. Now I turn it sideways in the same position in the same box and I'm looking at my magwell. The reason I wanna see my magwell is because with good eye hand coordination, I could point my finger where my eyes are, see where it needs to be poked and stick that finger in there the first time. Bam, two fingers, bam, one finger. Uh, I know where your head's at, I'm there too, but I'm gonna ignore that. So I have a magazine. Let's go over how to hold a magazine when you reload. Well, when you load or reload a magazine, if you load, you might just be loading from your pocket, from the nightstand, from your hand. But when you're reloading, you'll be typically taking this out of your pocket, off your kit, um, off of a mag holder. That circumstances is similar, um, but you have to hold it the same way. I, I always like to hold my magazines where the base plate, which is the bottom of the magazine, is in the heel or palm of my hand. I also like to run my pointy finger along the outside of the magazine with the bullet projectile facing towards my finger. That's because if I go to uh, reload this, I could stick my palm on it, feel good macro tension, grab it, upright it in one movement, and then stick it where it needs to go. So if I'm here, uh, even if I pick this magazine up off the ground like this, I'm gonna orient, orient it this way, keep it in the palm of my hand like this, hold it with my hand like this, and I'm gonna insert the magazine or the, or the uh, bullets into the position where I see in the magwell. When it gets uh, near the magwell where it's kind of clearing um, inside of the magwell, you are free to ride it home, which means I go like this and I don't waste time to guide it all the way in. I go like this, I lift up my finger and I ride it home with my palm, right? That slap is important especially under stress where I might be fighting, flailing, I get it, I focus on the magazine, I write it home, and then I'm done. In an admin reload, what I wanna do is I wanna stick it and then pull it. I wanna ensure this magazine is properly seated every single time. That's important, especially with a tactical reload where I have a round in the chamber, I drop the magazine, try to go to a different magazine, and then I load it up. Because when the bolt or the slide in this case is closed, it creates a little bit more tension of inserting the magazine because I mean, it's just obvious here, if this is open and then I go in and insert the magazine, there's no obstacles. But if I shut this, the obstacle is the bottom of the slide and it tends to stick, especially with carbines, which I'm gonna do all this with carbines. We're just talking pistols for right now. So it's open. I take this, even if it's like this, I rotate it where it needs to be. I insert it. When it clears the magwell, I ride it home, pull on it. Now I upright the gun. I'm looking down in my field of view for all you POV freaks. It's just like this. So I'm looking down at my bullet and I see the chamber. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my hand simply off the back of the gun and I'm gonna allow this gun or this slide to ride manually with no assistance because I want the spring and I want the uh, uh, recoil rod assembly to do all the work for me. That ensures a properly closed chamber on this gun, which is important because you have to have a closed chamber, a closed breech in order for the combustion to take place to not malfunction this gun. So I simply grab my hand over, I'm looking in the chamber and I watch it chamber. Now your eyes are probably not fast enough to watch this chamber, so how do I know around is inside the gun, or inside the barrel, or inside the breech, um, or inside the chamber. Well, I don't know. But on this SIG P320X, I do know because this little teat right here, which is little raised, that right there is telling me that there's a bullet inside the chamber. If I took this out, remove the source of feed, extract it around, close this, look, there's no teat. I want a teat. So 
as this is closed, now I know that there's a round here. Press check. During admin reloads, you need to conduct a press check if you don't have an indication method or means to identify that there's a round in the chamber. Glocks sometimes have barrels, like KKM barrels, that have holes in the top of the barrel where you can see the brass. Some of them have windows on the side where you can see the side of the brass, but that's optimal lighting. That's like me having a lamp, you know, bleeding light into the chamber. Well, you won't necessarily have that, so how do you know that a round's there? Well, if you press check it, which means I grab the front of the gun like this, or the rear of the gun like this, and I see brass, that's a good indication that it's good to go. I let go, and then I push with the rear of my thumb to ensure it's properly seated, ensuring that this is like a forward assist on a carbine. I'm just doing it with the back of the, of the uh, slide. Some people do this. I'm not a big fan of doing this. There's a firing pin in here. I don't want to be banging on this end of it, um, but I will take it like this, and then simply, that's out of breach. That's closed breach, right? That's all you got to do. And now I see the window if we didn't have that mechanism. So now I know it's loaded and it's good to go, but guess what? I just reduced this magazine capacity by one round. What do I want to do? Well, I want to drop the source of feed and I could even confirm that it's loaded by looking at my magazine. It had 17. Now I don't see the, the bullet window for 17. Um, so now I know that a round's in that gun and then I can simply top it off with an extra round. I always want to be sure I'm topping off my magazine with extra rounds. In this case, this is a 21 round magazine. One in the chamber, 21 plus one is 22. That's better than 21. So I'm gonna insert this again and then pull on it again to ensure it's properly seated. Now it's good to go and put away inside of my mag or inside of uh, my, my Kydex holster. And this is actually made by Phil Craft Survival. This is made by us guys. Um, okay, so let's talk about, we just talked about the loading procedure. Let's talk about the unloading procedure. Um, actually, we already did that. Let's talk about the loading procedures for slide lock and tactical reloads. Okay, here we go. What's a slide lock reload? Well, a slide lock reload, I'm going to do this for you guys because I care about you. I'm going to click the block here. So a slide lock reload means I'm out of ammo. So when this magazine's out of ammo, there's a little lip, a notch on this lip, which locks the slide. So if I insert this, close it, and then just wrap the slide, you're gonna get what happens during a slot lock reload when you run out of ammo. Remember, this could happen during malfunction. One thing you'll get better at while you shoot more, or when you shoot more, is you'll start feeling different things in your hands and with your ears uh, that are happening in the gun. You'll know what a malfunction sounds like or feels like versus a slide lock feels like or sounds like. I'm not a counter of rounds, but generally speaking, I understand the feeling of what it feels like to be light on mags. In fact, sometimes before a drill, I'll drop the mag because I know it's light and I'll look at it and there's one round. I'm like, oh, well, I can't do that five round drill. So I'll tap uh, uh, another mag and then do a, a tactical reload. In this case, with a slide lock reload, boom, 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 click, and I'm out. So what will happen is the slide will automatically lock to the rear and immediately, even in training, when you're not doing this, immediately you need to drive your hand back and drop that source of feed. Get used to getting rid of magazines in your gun that are empty because they're useless for you. That doesn't mean drop them in the dirt and never use them. It's all circumstantial. I don't even think that applies to what I'm talking about right now. Um, that's a legal term. But it all depends on the situation where if I'm in a gunfight and I'm potentially fighting for my life and... I don't know, it's apocalyptic, right? I, I'm, I need to retain magazines, then I might keep that magazine. But if I'm doing a slide lock reload while in an engagement, what do you think I'm worried about? I'm not worried about the magazine. I wanna launch this thing in the dirt as fast as possible, like a lawn dart, and I wanna get my gun up. One of the questions is, Mike, when you're shooting and engaging and you go to slide lock, do you keep your eyes focused on the threat or do you keep it focused on the gun? And here's the easy answer, the gun. Always the gun, that's it. The explanation, look, if you are in a slide lock fighting for your life, it does you no good to keep identifying what's happening with the threat by looking at the threat. You need your consciousness, your cognition, and your eye-hand coordination to be focused on getting that gun up as fast as possible by driving your eyes to the magwell, by pointing where your magwell's at, and seating that mag as fast as possible so you can get back on the gun. That's key. 
not looking at a threat while you're fumbling around with a magazine trying to work through a problem. Not recommended, okay? So we're here, we just dropped the magazine, we're rotating the gun. You notice there's not a lot of movement from here to here. It's one tilt of my wrist. So I'm going from here, my hand comes off, my, my hands don't manipulate, I turn the gun sideways, and I've only rotated a couple inches. As I'm here, I take the magazine, I throw my magazine towards the, the magwell when it's probably seated, I write it home, and then I readjust the grip on my hand, simultaneously releasing the slide catch, and then getting back on the gun, right? That happens at, at real, real speed, like this, right there, and then whoop, dropping like that, let me do that a little bit more efficient. So I'm here, boom, 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 click, grab the magazine, drop, and then I'm back on it. Really easy to practice this. You don't have to go super fast if you wanna get better. If you wanna get better in dry practice, not just dry firing, dry practice, I would sit here, even on this desk, drop my magazine, turn the gun, insert, when I'm clear of the mag, well, insert, that's fast, and then rotate and practice the rotation on my hands, right? Some of you little people will not have big of hands as, as me, right? This hand is easy to manipulate the pistol, but when you insert it, if you don't have big hands, you might want to think about rotating the gun over and uh, that would happen if it was loaded. In fact, let me show you that just to show you if there's a round in it, right? And you seat it, I could turn it, grab the slide and like ride it home and then set my grip. Okay, that's acceptable. Now, is it fast? No, not as fast as the other way, but sometimes you don't have an option. Tactical reloads. Let me explain tactical reloads. So a tactical reload, we are focused on getting another magazine in the gun. This is a Tri-11, one of my favorite guns from Tri-11. One, two, three. Um, this gun is uh, set up and I'm gonna do a tactical reload, which means I went, I was shooting and I ran out of, I ran out of a certain amount of rounds. That, that, that's a bad way to word it. I shot some rounds. And now I want to top it off before I do something else. Maybe before you enter another room. Maybe before you uh, move to another building. Maybe before you leave your car. You want it to be topped off. So how would this work? One, you would drop the magazine that you have. Stow it. Because you have the time. I've done plenty of tactical reloads in combat. You have the time. Take your other magazine. Simply insert it and pull it. Always ensure you do that. Because the difference between a, a, a tactical and slide lock, I told you that this is closed now over a breach, which means it's a closed breach, it's stiffer, and this magazine is gonna have a little bit of a hard time sticking where it needs to stick, uh, especially with a carbine. So push and then pull and make sure it's probably seated, then go back to work, okay? So it's pretty easy. Another technique is I have the magazine inserted, I drop the magazine, into my palm, oh, I'm sorry, I first grab the magazine that I'm gonna work with, I drop the old magazine in my palm, I reinsert the new magazine, and then I stow this into another mag carrier. Uh, remember, always take your old magazines and stow them away in order of precedence or order of priority uh, for magazines that are full. So I would reorder my magazines, making sure the next one that I go to, which is closest to my center waistline, I'm gonna grab that and it's gonna be fully topped off. The lighter magazines that I tactical reloaded out of, I'm gonna put more to the rear as a last ditch replacement. If I have to go to that, I'm gonna to go to it, but I wanna to have top off mags in advance. So you'll just have to reorder some stuff. Now, every tactical reload that I've done in combat, I've had time. I've taken knees behind buildings, I've called out, hey, tactic, tactic reload or reload, and then I get the gun up, I reconfigure my mag, put it in my dump pouch, put it in my pocket, uh, put it wherever it needs to be, and then I go to, go to work. Uh, ensure that you understand the big differences between those. Remember, a slide lock, the worst case is you were in the middle of an engagement and you ran out of ammo. That's pretty bad circumstances. The tactical reload is you're trying to get a tactical advantage in getting your gun up. Last thing I want to talk about, because this video is going longer than I thought, I'm going to sweat a little, is this is a single action uh, army revolver pistol. This is like the single action army that was designed after Colt. This is the Ruger Vaquero, which is the Ruger version of it. One of my favorite little cowboy action guns. I love this gun. I love the belt that came with. I actually love cowboy action. 
Uh, I love the history behind this gun. This pistol is a good example of how you should understand what double action is. This is a single action gun, meaning I could, I could pull the trigger all I want on this gun. Nothing is going to happen, right? Nothing will happen. The action of pulling the gun to the rear is the only way in one action of this going forward that this gun's going to shoot. So the gun goes boom. With a double action pistol, when I pull the trigger, the hammer goes back by itself and it drops forward as I pull the trigger. But after that first round, it's going to be, typically the side slide reciprocates that, it's going to be set up for single action only. This is a single action only pistol, which is similar to the Glock or this particular pistol here. There's only one action it takes uh, to get it set up, which is I have to cock the hammer. Now with this being single action only, I don't have to cock the hammer, right? I, this is setting me up, but for this, chambering around is setting me up. I wanted you show, to show you that kind of distinct difference because uh, in understanding hammers with revolvers, you kind of get a sense of what's happening inside the gun. This is single action. I drop the hammer, I pull the trigger. This is single action only, where I chamber around, I pull the trigger and it goes boom. I hope that helps guys. And I hope that uh, you like, you're liking these blocks of instruction. I'm gonna get started on some bug out stuff. I appreciate you guys and I hope you have a good day. Look, just always wanting to highlight this. This is an opportunity for you to be better prepared. You know, as a CEO and owner of Phil Craft Survival Preparedness Company, who's been doing this for five years, I don't want you to think that I'm um, mongering or I'm trying to just push some agenda. The pandemic is a serious issue. I think it's more serious than people initially thought because three weeks ago when I was saying, hey, we need to take this into consideration and get prepared. Hell, when I posted a post November before this even happened, I was talking, are we prepared for pandemics? The answer is absolutely. We're not pre prepared. But use this opportunity in self-loathing to take the time with your family and friends to mental model some ideas on how you should be better prepared. Use our resources, the Phil Craft Survival Podcast. Use our resources, the Phil Craft Survival YouTube channel, uh, the, our Instagram, our Facebook, and the list goes on. Our prepped everyday carry uh, uh, course, or I'm sorry, uh, Facebook page on, on Facebook. All these things are going to get you a better understanding of some things that you could do to be better prepared. It, does, it doesn't always have to deal with firearms. It can, di it can uh, revolve around food. It can revolve around sustainable living. It can revolve around mindset. Uh, just don't drop the ball and use this as an opportunity to grow in preparedness. Thanks, guys. Hope you have a good day. Peace out. Stay alert. Stay alive.